So our understanding of the universe has changed enormously over the last century. And today I want to share with you just a part of that journey and also share with you what the questions that we face at the cosmic frontier, what those questions are today. So a century ago, scientists were grappling with the question as to whether there were even galaxies beyond the Milky Way galaxy that hosts our solar system. We can look back in distance and time by capturing particles of light that have traveled literally billions of years to get here so that we can record them. The image on the screen is a very famous image by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this image was produced by staring at a single patch of the sky for longer than any patch had ever been stared at by the Hubble Space Telescope. It was about a dozen days staring at the same patch of the sky. That patch of the sky was chosen because it avoided all stars, everything in our galaxy, and it looked empty. But after staring for 12 days, enough light was gathered that we get this image. This image covers a tiny portion of the sky. It's about one ten millionth of the entire sky. But at full resolution, there are roughly 10,000 galaxies in that image. And the furthest galaxies that are furthest away, the light has been traveling towards us for more than 13 billion years. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old. So those galaxies were formed when the universe was less than a billion years old. Now, the part of this talk that I, what I'm going to focus on in this talk actually is not the galaxies, but the space between the galaxies. So a century ago, Einstein was developing his theory of general relativity. And one of the things that he discovered early on, and others realized too, that came naturally out of his theory, was that space itself expands, that galaxies are embedded in space that can expand. At that point, looking out into the universe, the universe looked static. So he thought this was a mistake. So he could actually cleanly fix the problem by putting a very simple mathematical term in the theory of general relativity called the cosmological constant that would actually would exactly balance this tendency for space to expand. So everything was fine, the universe was static. Then a dozen years later, Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble Space Telescope was named, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe actually is expanding. And so Einstein took his cosmological constant out, put it on the shelf, but remember it because it will come back later in the story. So let's talk a little bit more about what we mean by expanding space. I said these galaxies are embedded in space that can expand. This is very much, actually I'm going to use an analogy that is uh, good at many levels as you'll see. Space is like expanding bread dough. Okay, so imagine the dough expanding, and the galaxies are like raisins embedded in the dough. As the dough expands, do the raisins move through the dough? No, they just move with the dough. So that's the kind of expansion that's going on. Let me help you picture that. So in this image, we're going to let the space between the spheres expand. Notice that the size of the spheres are not expanding, and the size of the rulers are not expanding, just the space between them. That's like the raisins in the bread dough don't expand, the raisins don't expand, only the dough does, because the chemistry of the raisins is different from the chemistry of the, doughs, of the dough. The same thing with the galaxies in the universe. The galaxies don't actually change in size because their size is controlled by physics that's different from the physics that's causing space to expand. So now I need to tell you about how Hubble determined that space in our universe was expanding. He did it by measuring that the galaxies were receding away from us, but in a very special way. So let's go back to the raisins in the bread dough. Imagine that I'm a raisin in the middle of the dough, and there's a raisin one inch away from me. Suppose that the dough is doubling in each dimension every hour. If a raisin starts one inch away from me, after one hour, the dough has doubled, so how far away is it? Two inches. How far has it moved? One inch. So I look at it and say that it has moved on average one inch per hour. Now, the crux is, consider a raisin that's two inches away. After one hour, how far away is it? Four inches, so it has moved two inches in an hour. So its speed, according to me, is two inches per hour. So me, a raisin in the dough, I look around and I see all the raisins moving away from me, and the speed with which they're moving 
it increases with the distance of those raisins. If instead we look, and so I think I am a very special raisin because everything's moving away from me. But of course, if we consider another raisin, that raisin sees exactly the same thing. So in an expanding universe where space itself is expanding, every observer in that universe will see all the objects in the universe moving away from it with an apparent speed that it increases with the distance. So how do we measure these things? So first of all, how do we even detect a galaxy? So here's a little image of a galaxy. We detect the galaxy with a telescope, or let's say an optical instrument like our eye, and if the galaxy is moving away from us through the universe, it emits light at one point, and so that arrow uh, depicts a particle of light traveling towards us. Now, as light, so light, you heard about in the um, previous uh, video, um, light is an electromagnetic wave, and this slinky is an analogy for the light. And the distance between the coils on the slinky are like the wavelength of light. So light is a wave, the distance between this is the wavelength. And let me remind you that red light has a longer wavelength than blue light. So if this galaxy emits blue light with a wavelength like this, as it travels through space, space itself is expanding. Therefore, by the time the light reaches us, it has a longer wavelength. We say that it has shifted towards the red or red shifted. So we measure the red shift of the light, uh, the wavelength of the light, and from that deduce how far away the galaxy, uh, or the, the speed with which the galaxy is receding away from us. So um, the blue light has turned into red light. So what did Hubble measure? His data didn't look anything as clean as this, okay? So this is um, my simplified version. So on the bottom axis, we see red shift. So the more, the longer the wavelength, the, fast, the um, faster the speed at which the galaxy is receding away from us. And then on the vertical axis is the increasing distance to the galaxy. And just like the raisins in the bread dough, the further away the raisins are, the higher the speed or the higher the red shift. So um, his data, like I said, um, Edwin Hubble's had a lot more scatter, but he basically showed this behavior. Now, the question marks at the top represent that he was looking at relatively nearby galaxies. And the question was, what would happen if you looked at galaxies very, very far away? Because in this space is embedded all these galaxies that gravitationally attract each other, slowing down the expansion of space. It's like all these raisins are pulling towards each other and slowing down the rising of the bread dough. So we would expect that this expansion of space should slow down. So for most of the 20th century, people had the ambition to try to measure that. But it was extremely difficult because it's very hard to measure the distance to a galaxy. We don't have rulers that we can lay out in the universe to measure the distance. How do we measure distances to very far away objects? We do it by taking advantage of something called standard candles. So standard candles are light sources that all have the same absolute brightness. So let me show you a picture here of a um, bunch of standard candles. Okay, they're, they're all identical candles, but if they are further away, they appear to be dimmer. So we can use the apparent brightness of standard candles to measure distance. So the question is, do we have standard candles in the universe, Ab objects that all have the same absolute brightness? And um, on top of that, we want to be measuring distances to objects that are billions of light years away. So they, this has to be a very bright standard candle. So what is a very bright object that explodes in the universe? A supernova. And in, in fact, a very particular type of supernova, called a type 1a supernova, serves as a very good standard candle. And this was only realized in the mid to late 1980s. So in a type 1a supernova, we have a white dwarf, which is the um, object on the left. It's a dead star. It's a partner within a binary system with a gaseous star. Matter is accreting off the gaseous star onto the white dwarf. The white dwarf grows until it reaches that very critical size of 1.4 times the mass of the sun, at which point a thermonuclear explosion occurs. It's basically a fusion bomb, except the size of this bomb is 1.4 times the mass of the sun. That's a bright enough explosion that we can see it on Earth. 
Now you might think, well, that's going to be really bright. When in doing these measurements, the furthest supernova that were detected would be like detecting a, a household light bulb on the moon from Earth. Okay, so you got to collect um, a lot of um, a very sensitive instrument to see this. So here's an example of a galaxy where a supernova has exploded. Um, and let me show you here uh, some data, some real data of a supernova. So on the left, we see a galaxy in which the supernova is exploding towards the left. There it goes. Now, um, one of the challenges is that in a typical galaxy, one of these supernova will go off only once every 500 years. So you have to watch a lot of galaxies. Okay? In the upper right is another challenge that we want to measure. It's only a standard candle if we measure its brightness at its peak. And it takes about two weeks to go up to the peak. So you have about two weeks to notice that a galaxy did not have a supernova and then had a supernova. So another challenge, you've got to be watching all those galaxies all the time because you don't know when the supernova is going to go off. And then finally, you've got to make sure that you've got a type 1a supernova, this very special kind that's due to a binary system. Not all supernova are of that type. So you use what's in the bottom right, which is you look at the whole spectrum, all the light coming off, hopefully, um, if, if you've got enough data, and how that varies with time, and that's, it has a very specific signal. Signature. So once you've done all that, and that's what took the time in the 20th century to do, you can now look at the same diagram that Hubble made, except we're going to extend it to higher redshifts and further distances. So in 1996, a set of data was published for supernovae that are relatively close by, but still a lot further than people had measured before, using these type 1a supernova. Everything was lying nicely on the line. And I don't know if you can see the yellow line on the screen. There's a yellow line extending up to the corner. That's what the expectation was for a galaxy in which we have all this gravitationally attracting stuff slowing down the expansion. So what was actually measured? So every point on this uh, graph is another supernova that was observed. So there are about just, uh, just under 50 of them here. And this is one of the first projects to release this data in 1998. And what's happened with the dots? They are not clustered on the yellow line. They are all to the left of the yellow line. So let's go through the logic there. For a given brightness on the vertical axis, the redshift is less than expected, okay, to the left. That means that the universe was expanding at less than the expected rate in the past, which means that the universe is expanding at an ever-increasing rate. It's not slowing down. Instead, the expansion is taking off. When these experiments were done, the expectation was that we wanted to measure at what was the rate of the slowing down? When will this ex the expansion stop and the universe perhaps contract? Instead, the conclusion is it's taking off and the universe is just going to become more and more dilute. And we live in a special time that we can actually see the galaxies around us. They haven't expanded so far away from us that we can't see them anymore. So why is this? So we actually don't know. Now, <laughs> this was totally unexpected. But remember that cosmological constant that we put on the shelf that we had to uh, dispose of because Einstein didn't need it when we discovered that space was expanding? It turns out that if you put that term back in, you will get this kind of an effect, that the expansion of the universe will take off. But the size of, you know, of that, of how much you have to put in, is completely ad hoc, meaning we have no fundamental understanding of why it's there and why we need that much of it. Now, when you put it in the, in the equations in general relativity, this substance that causes this has dimensions of energy, energy density. So we can actually say, what is the energy density of the universe and how much of it is in the form of this stuff? Now, we better put a label on our ignorance as to what this is. So the label that we put on it is dark energy. And when we ask how much energy is there in this form, it's over two thirds of the energy density of the universe. You say, well, how could we not have known about that? We actually did have hints earlier that things just weren't working out. So although this was a surprise and was treated with some skepticism, it turns out it solved a lot of problems because now we could actually explain a lot of other things that were mysterious. So what's the other one third? The other one third is the gravitationally attracting stuff. Now, I would be remiss to not tell you about another mystery that we have and another very fundamental thing that we don't understand about the universe. And that's that, that gravitationally attracting stuff 
Actually, about only a fraction of it is the ordinary matter that makes up you and me and our Earth and our solar system and our galaxy, etc. And the other part, about a quarter of the energy density of the universe, is gravitationally attracting stuff that we don't know what it is. It's invisible. We only know it's there because of its gravitational attraction. So we better put a label on our ignorance there too. We call it dark matter. So now we see our view of the universe. 95% of the universe is made of stuff that we don't understand what it is. Okay? So, um, so th that's the frontier of understanding the universe. Now, this dark matter, whoops, let me back up a minute. I don't want to spoil that for you. Um, the dark matter in the universe, when we look at an image with like the Hubble Space Telescope with all those galaxies, those galaxies are markers for us of they actually live in clumps of dark matter where the clump of dark matter is much larger than the galaxy itself. So the galaxies don't dominate, they're just like little LEDs lighting up where the matter is. And that's very much like this image of the Earth at night from space, where the lights are telling us where the matter is or where the land is. And you can see Jamaica there as the bright spot in the Caribbean, okay? Um, and you can see that there are other islands there that are not very lit up, but, um, so, but, but the light at night is kind of a tracer as to where the land is. So the galaxies are like tracers of where the dark matter is in the universe. Now, we run simulations starting at the beginning of the universe and just running them forward and let gravity play its role and ask ourselves, how does that dark matter clump? And what we see is pictures like this on the screen where the dark matter is not uniformly distributed. It's a webby structure with filaments and voids, and then the galaxies are just markers as to where the dark matter is. And so on the right, that's a model where we've put in galaxies where the, the dark matter is, and that's how we think that they occupy the dark matter. Now, why do we run these simulations and put the galaxies in? It's so that we can compare our measurements of where the galaxies are. So this picture, is um, on the left here, um, observations of millions of galaxies taken from Earth, and here is our eyeball looking out, okay, and the color depicts how red shifted it is or how far away the galaxy is. Close by, we have imaged so many galaxies that the dots just become a blur, but as you look further away, you can start to see that kind of webby structure. Then we run simulations and embed the, the galaxies in the simulations and compare it to the observations. And even though every galaxy is not in the same place, the texture is the same. So in cosmology, we measure the texture of the universe and use that to determine what the universe is made of. So I want to tell you about just mention something. You'll have to watch a TED talk on dark matter to learn more about this, that the dark matter in the universe, because it gravitationally uh, uh, has such a strong uh, effect, it bends light itself like in a mirage, like a desert mirage. So it can produce optical illusions and delusions, okay, in the sky, like this, where you see these arcs in the sky. Those are actually distorted images of background galaxies. But by measuring these arcs, we can map out how the dark matter is distributed today and in the past, and how the dark energy, which has been causing space to expand and slow down the growth of structure, how that dark energy has been evolving with time. So to wrap up then, the cosmic frontier is the questions of what is the dark matter and what is the dark energy in the universe. We have proposals for tackling this with instruments from space, with um, an instrument from the ground. This is a future instrument and I'm involved in this called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. These projects involve many, many people from many countries, um, and in this picture, uh, I'm there on the right, okay? Um, and this is a collaboration meeting for this, uh, building this telescope. So to understand the cosmic frontier, we need cooperation between governments, um, between uh, funding agencies. We need collaboration of people from all over the world. And we need a healthy dose of competition, as we've heard earlier, that humans actually get inspired by competing with their neighbors or with, uh, with um, their other uh, collaborators. Um, and so in order to address the questions at the cosmic frontier, it'll take some time. And for the students in the audience, the questions will still be waiting for you to answer, I'm sure, when you're in college and beyond. So I hope you're inspired by some of the questions at the cosmic frontier. Thank you.